Hey, good day to you. Welcome to the Tuesday edition of RFD Today. I'm Rita Frazier. In studio, we'll digest some agriculture headlines here at the beginning of the program. We'll talk weather at the end of the program. Not a very good subject for most people as it is not only affecting our farmers, those unplanted acres, but of course on our markets as we are looking at an interesting trade week. We'll check in with Dr. Nicholas Ripple later in the hour. He is with Sandy Creek Farms and Buffalo Run Farm, Marshall County. That proposal had a public hearing just a couple of weeks ago on the the new operation. We'll talk to veterinarian Dr. Nicholas Ripple about the good news for livestock farmers, what it means to Illinois. If you are opening your new edition of Farm Week this week, there's a special insert, and it's the livestock segment. There's a great piece, uh, several great pieces, that focus in on the business of livestock in Illinois, what it means uh, to not only agriculture, but to the rural economy, school districts, and the tax base, et cetera. So coming up, a conversation there. Also, Farm Week's Dan Grant on the road this past week. He covered the IBA Summer Conference. That meeting took place at Effingham, successful event. And he caught up with the president of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, Jennifer Houston. We'll also, again, talk markets and weather It's all coming your way on this edition of RFD Today. Stay with us. Look up, look down, look around. Look up, look down, look around. In the trees and on the ground, because the ALB must be found. If you're hearing this, you should be concerned about the Asian longhorn beetle, an invasive species that's destroying our trees. But you can help. Look for the signs and help stop the beetle. Look up, look down, look around. Look up, look down, look around. In the trees and on the ground, because the ALB must be found. Some signs of the ALB are dime-sized holes on tree trunks, a sawdust-like material called frass, and the beetle itself with a long black body and white spots. Look up, look down, look around, look up, look down, look around. In the trees and on the ground, cause the ALB must be found. Learn all the signs and how to report them at AsianLonghornedBeetle.com. That's AsianLonghornedBeetle.com. Farm Week and FarmWeekNow.com journalist Daniel Grant connect rural routes for you. With more than two decades of reporting under his belt, Dan is the go-to source for farmers when it comes to commodities. Here's a bit about his rural roots. I grew up on a grain and livestock farm near Roseville in Warren County. What I love about my job is working with people, traveling across Illinois, and visiting farms along the way. Be it routes or roots, RFD Radio, FarmWeekNow.com, and FarmWeek keep you connected. What's the excitement about buying a brand new car when you pay full price for it? County Farm Bureau members have a reason to be excited. A Farm Bureau membership gives you two car purchase discounts. When members buy a new Ford vehicle, they receive $500 off their purchase. And with the purchase of a qualifying Lincoln vehicle, they receive $750 off. Everyone loves a good deal, and the money saved is worth the price of our annual membership. This is just one of our 300,000 plus discounts that are always changing to fit our members' needs. Not a Farm Bureau member? Visit Illinois Farm Bureau online and join today. When you're selling large acreage farm or recreational property, few things are as important as a quick sell at the right price. And as one of the most viewed real estate websites in the Midwest, listing your property with buyafarm.com is a great place to start. But if you're looking for a quicker turnaround, our professional land auction services consistently move property by attracting serious buyers. The bidding is closed and the farm is sold. Whether you're selling or looking to buy, think buyafarm.com. We're back here on RFD today on a Tuesday, June 18th. We'll start this hour in the field with Pioneer Field agronomist Jason McVicker. Jason, tell us quickly about your territory that you cover for Illinois and more about your assessment 
on June 18th. Thank you, Rita. I cover the uh, the northern part of Illinois, so along the Interstate 80 corridor from about Princeton over to Morris and north and south from there. Uh, there's no doubt that this spring has been challenging getting the crop in. Had a few pockets around Easter that were able to get uh, get some corn in the ground, but really most of the progress was made within the uh, last 10-day planting window in June. And even with that later planting, I've been really impressed with how quick the crop came out of the ground and how good the stand looks. The biggest question is what we're going to get for heat units and GDUs to finish that crop out as we uh, progress through the season. Interesting conversation you and I were having today about asking so much of this corn crop, and we do. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the early planted stuff that was around that Easter time frame, it amazed me that it sat in the ground for a good four weeks and still was able to, uh, to emerge. And really, I thought the stands looked pretty good on that, that earlier planted stuff. Now it's running into some challenges as well as we're starting to see a transition from, from that seed reserve to the root. Uh, some unevenness, some yellowing, things like that. But as the season progresses, and even on this, uh, some of this later planted corn, uh, there's no doubt that it's going to be in a higher uh, risk factor for a high disease environment. And we really need to put our management hats on and take a look at some of those higher risk environments, corn on corn, for example, and try to get a plan in place uh, based off of the hybrid, the environment, when it comes to foliar fungicide applications, because standability is going to be critical. Plant health is going to be critical. We're going to be harvesting wetter corn than what we typically do, and therefore it's going to max out some of our drying capabilities, and we're going to ask that crop to stand even longer. And if if it goes unprotected or if it's uh, you know lower on disease tolerance, it could be a challenging fall. So as you said, underlying your message, uh, even though no one wants to put more money in this crop, a consideration of those factors should be made here in mid-June. Absolutely. We'll have more with Jason McVicker, Pioneer Field Agronomist, later this week here on RFD Today. We'll be back. This segment is brought to you by Il Soy Advisor. When you need a hand in the fight against insects, diseases, or low margins, click for backup you can trust. Check off funded Il Soy Advisor is always at the ready with articles, tools, and webinars from agronomic experts and CCAs experienced in defeating pests and problems in Illinois fields. Find answers and advice for whatever you're up against at ilsoyadvisor.com. That's I-L-S-O-Y advisor.com. In the headlines, U.S. farmers this year may not plant roughly 8 million acres due to wet conditions. Industry analysts polled by Bloomberg News say farmers are expected to forego planting on 2.2 million acres of soybeans and 6.7 million acres of corn. The Midwest facing another seven-day forecast for near daily rain chances, continuing the wettest 12-month period on record. For soybeans, the 2.2 million unplanted acres are just below a 2.23 million acre record set back in 2015. Last week, the Department of Agriculture cut its corn planting and production forecast, but made no changes to soybeans, making note that there are still some windows of opportunities to plant beans. Yesterday, the USDA weekly crop progress report showed farmers had planted an estimated 83% of corn and 60% of soybeans this spring. USDA reported 62% corn and 34% of soybeans have emerged. For this time of year, the five-year average shows corn plantings usually finished. 93% of the soybeans typically have been planted this time of year. The U.S. and Canada Monday announced a plan to allow for a safe trade to continue if African swine fever is reported in either country. The U.S. Department of Agriculture and Canadian Food Inspection Agency have worked to modify their export certificates to allow trade of live swine, pet food, and animal byproducts and meat to continue in approved disease-free zones in the event of an ASF outbreak, 
Zoning is an internationally recognized tool used to help manage diseases and facilitate trade. If a case of ASF is identified, geographic boundaries are defined to contain the outbreak. Geographic boundaries are controlled zones established under the World Organization for Animal Health Guidelines. The areas outside of these controlled zones are disease-free zones. A global threat, the two agencies say, ASF cannot be addressed in isolation. The agencies contend that working together is the best way to address the threat of ASF while maintaining trade of pork products, which are important to the North American economy. More people are getting sick from backyard poultry flocks. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says an additional 227 people have become ill from salmonella in backyard poultry flocks since the month of May. The ongoing investigation overall confirmed 279 illnesses in 41 states. People who got sick reported getting chicks and ducklings from places such as ag stores, websites, and hatcheries. About one-third of the illnesses were reported in children under the age of five. We'll break. When we come back, DeLoss is back to talk more agronomy. This is RFD Today. RFD Radio Network's DeLoss Yonkey connects rural routes for you. DeLoss delivers essential farm and food-related news to our listeners. His witty voice has been heard on the air for more than two decades. Here's a bit about his rural roots. Growing up on a farm prepared me for my career. I try to know a little about a lot of things and let the people I interview be the experts. I've always wanted to be on the radio. I'm just happy to do what I enjoy. Be it routes or roots, RFD Radio, FarmWeekNow.com, and FarmWeek keep you connected. Does the warmer weather have you itching for a weekend getaway? Take your Illinois Farm Bureau membership savings with you. Farm Bureau members can save up to 20% at choice hotels, including favorites like Comfort Suites, Sleep in quality in and suites with even more to choose from. Call 800 258 2847 or visit the Choice Hotels website to search all the hotels at once and to make advanced reservations. Contact your local County Farm Bureau for your discount code number. As a farmer, your needs are constantly changing, and Country Financial is here to continuously change with you to meet those needs. That's why we're expanding our crop hail coverage to now include industrial hemp crops, a legal agricultural commodity according to the 2018 Farm Bill. As you add new crops to your operation, we're here growing with you every step of the way. Learn more at countryfinancial.com backslash hemp coverage. Crop hail insurance policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Are dicamba products an important part of your toolbox this planting season? The state of Illinois has revised the cutoff date for their use. You can use the products over the top of soybeans until whichever of these comes first. 45 days post planting, your soybeans reach the V4 or R1 growth stage depending on the product or July 15th. State-specific labels work in conjunction with federal labels, so make sure you read and follow both. Remember, the label is the law. To find out more, visit ILFB.org forward slash label aware. Most of us like to be out in the sun. That's why sunscreen and other safety measures are key to protecting your skin from aging and cancer. The FDA recommends using a sunscreen with a sun protection factor, or SPF, of 15 or higher. Also, look for broad spectrum on the label. That means both harmful ultraviolet A and B rays are blocked. UVA rays age the skin. UVB rays burn. And both cause cancer. But the perfect sunscreen doesn't count if you use it wrong. Don't need sunscreen on a cloudy day? Wrong. 80% of UV rays still get through the haze. Only use sunscreen at the beach? Nope. Anytime you're outside, UV rays attack the skin, so you need protection. And you have to reapply sunscreen every two hours. Remember, SPF plus broad spectrum equals healthy fun in the sun. Visit www.fda.gov slash sunscreen for more information. A message from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Welcome back to RFD Today on a Tuesday. I'm DeLos Yonke, and our grow mark agronomists are at the Bear Learning Center just south of Monmouth in Warren County. 
Victoria Klejewski and Michael Gill are both on the phone. Uh, Victoria, let me ask you if we can go ladies first here and different calls that you've been getting from the field in such a strange growing season so far. Uh, if we could talk soybeans first and just what kind of pests folks are dealing with already. This year has been a pretty interesting year because, of course, you know, the, the weedy fields that we had for a longer time since that burned down uh, wasn't put on on time. And then, of course, the late planting. So uh, I've been getting these calls that you get once every five or ten years. Mm. On uh, there was a field that had about 25 acres that were devastated by uh, variegated cutworm. Variegated cutworm it's a pest that has a pretty wide range. It feeds on vegetables, ornamental crops, uh, and field crops as well. So what I'm thinking is that probably uh, you know this particular field or this particular farmer. There was, there's really a lot of uh, winter annuals in there, like cheekweeds and, and hembits that were uh, burned down probably kind of late. And then the crop was planted, the soybeans were coming out of the ground. So these uh, worms didn't really have much time to starve to death. They probably just switched from the weeds to the crop as it was coming out of the ground. And a variegated cutworm is a little different from black cutworm in the sense that it does not clip the plants at the base. It almost, it feels, it feeds almost like a, like an army worm where it starts feeding from the top of the plant all the way down. So it mows the plant all the way, all the way down. And, uh, in this particular field that the grower had to replant because the damage was so widely spread and the crop was pretty much gone in just a few nights of feeding. That was a very interesting call, something you don't see every year. Um, the, the worms were pretty big already, um, probably for a fifth or sixth insert larva. And so the problem about this is that once they devastated that field, they were moving on to the newer soybeans that were coming out of the ground. And so, um, you know, I advise the farmer to just try to, to treat the edge of the damage to, to slow them down or prevent them from moving into those new soybeans and attack them. Well, thankfully, calls like that don't come uh, every year. This, this is going to be quite an interesting one, by the way, um, thinking about for corn, especially if the price continues to stay strong. And, and those that have a crop will want to preserve it as much as possible. So, I assume at some point it'll be a good discussion about whether or not to uh, use a fungicide. Uh, yeah, and, and it's, I mean, I, I imagine, uh, you know, the whole industry is going to be struggling with this because, of course, you know, the yields have already uh, probably taken a hit on mm -hmm. their yield potential just because of the late planting. And then so the, the management, I mean, most farmers are probably – going to try to 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 save as much on crop protection products and try to you know avoid you know fungicide applications and, and things like that unless it's absolutely necessary which you know if we continue to have this moist uh, environment um, you know I, I imagine we're we're probably going to have a few issues with uh, with uh, fungal pathogens um, if, if the weather continues to to stay to stay wait like it is. So in that case, you know, I think um, avoiding fungicide applications might not be the best because you've got to try to protect as much of that yield that's left as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it'll be an interesting discussion to have, you know, when the time comes for, sure. for that uh, tasseling silk in time on yeah. corn and, and, and stuff. Yeah. This year, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. Who knows what what will be uh, here between here and then. But uh, I think one question, Michael, and I was just talking about this last week of just, you know, how do you know what you have in a year where you couldn't, especially if you couldn't put on uh, applications the way you were supposed to, how do you even know what you have from a fertility standpoint? Well, that's a good question, Delos. Um, there, you know, I mean, in particular, a lot of the questions I've been getting are in and around nitrogen loss. And, you know, I mean, we've had the, the right conditions for loss to occur. We, we've had uh, a lot of soil moisture, uh, and uh, soil moisture is always a bad thing in the sense of nitrate nitrogen. Um, it, it can either be lost in one of two ways, through leaching down through the soil profile out of the, the root zone where uh, corn roots actively are growing, which is about that top two foot of soil, and um, or it can be lost through denitrification back into the atmosphere. and. You know, we've had uh, some crop specialists doing a lot of sampling, and there really is no rhyme or reason on a field-by-field -field basis when we look at these results. 
but that is the best way to figure out what you have left out there, and that is the soil test. And and we prefer a soil test that, that tests not only for nitrate form nitrogen in the field, but also for ammonium form nitrogen, and, and then be able to figure what we have for plant available nitrogen, sometimes referred to as PAN. Mm-hmm. Um, this this will give you a good idea of what's out in that field, and, and typically in a corn crop, um, in a normal season, if we're seeing 25 parts per million nitrogen there total in that top foot of uh, two foot of soil, we're, we're really in pretty good shape. How quickly do I get that kind of information? Now is the time to act. Uh, typically, labs have a short turnaround time on these. They, they realize the importance of getting these results back to an individual, and, and that time is usually with, within less than a week's time. So if you send those samples in, and, and we have a, a website that, that really tells you how to sample uh, if you go to nwatchonline.com, and it will uh, tell you for your type of application, whether you broadcast or whether you, you are knifing it in or banding it on uh, the nitrogen, it'll, it'll give you a different methodology for how you take those samples in that field. But uh, typically, in, in all truthfulness, it, it's less than a week's time that you see your results come back oh, to you. very good. Rita will have more with Victoria and Michael in just a little bit. And we will come back here on the network with a more of a conversation with the Growmark agronomy team out in the field across the state. This is RFD Today. More farm news and information ahead. Stay tuned for more RFD Today here on the Illinois Farm Bureau Radio Network. RFD Radio Network's Jim Taylor connects rural routes for you. You can trust Jim every morning for your overnight markets. He gets up early to help keep farmers on top of their game. Here's a bit about his rural routes. I have the opportunity to cover something different every day and provide listeners with up-to-date markets, news they need to do their job and be successful, from legislative issues to crop updates and weather, of course. Be it routes or routes, RFD Radio, FarmWeekNow.com, and FarmWeek keep you connected. The Illinois economy runs on our homegrown agricultural products. Our dairy, beef, pork, corn, and soybeans grow the agricultural industry by nearly $20 billion each year. But we don't just grow Illinois, we grow North America. Canada and Mexico account for over $45 billion in U.S. agricultural exports, and they support more than 1 million American jobs. Exports to Canada and Mexico matter to everyone in the agriculture and food industries. A message from Illinois farmers and their checkoff programs. Farm, family, food. Those three words best describe Illinois Farm Bureau. Farm. For 100 years, Farm Bureau in Illinois has represented and served the men and women who make Illinois one of the top food producing states. Family. At the heart of rural Illinois are traditional farm families who work together through Illinois Farm Bureau. And food. Farm Bureau families are proud to grow the healthy food they provide their families and yours. Farm, family, food. The heart of Farm Bureau in Illinois. Are dicamba products an important part of your toolbox this planting season? The state of Illinois has revised the cutoff date for their use. You can use the products over the top of soybeans and tell whichever of these comes first. 45 days post planting, your soybeans reach the V4 or R1 growth stage depending on the product or July 15th. State-specific labels work in conjunction with federal labels, so make sure you read and follow both. Remember, the label is the law. To find out more, visit ilfb.org forward slash label aware. All Ag. All Illinois. All Now. There are a lot of smartphone apps out there, but do they have what's important to us here in Illinois? The Farm Week Now app does, and it's always at your fingertips. All Ag, All Illinois, and 24-7 where and when you need it for free. Go to your app or Play Store on your smartphone, hit search, type in Farm Week Now, that's one word, and download it today. Brought to you by Illinois Farm Bureau, where we're all about farm, family, and food. Yes, I listen to a lot of talk radio, but I wouldn't call myself a political junkie. I guess that's why I like being a member of the Illinois Farm Bureau. No matter what my comfort level is, Farm Bureau has something for me and my farm. As an Illinois Farm Bureau member, I can pick and choose what's best for me, from reading election news in Farm Week to actually going to Washington. That's enough to make me a policy nut after all. Call your county Farm Bureau and customize your membership today.
Joining us over the phones are uh, Gromark agronomy experts, Victoria Klazewski, Michael Gill, who are in Warren County at the Bear Learning Center. They have uh, plot work over there as well. Uh, one of the things, uh, we talked a little bit of corn. We, we talked about pests and soybeans. What about for corn? You know, one of my questions, supposedly late planted corn, you know, gets pretty tall pretty quickly. Well, not supposedly. I mean, that's, that's the way it, wor- it, it works. So is there any, are there any concerns about it, you know, in its stand and getting too tall too fast? Hopefully some rootworms and, and things like that aren't going to uh, cause any problems. Yeah, so, well, the one thing, of course, with the rapid growth and everything, I mean, green snap, it's in every, everybody's mind in a year like this, for sure. Um, as far as, uh, you know, rootworms go, you said, you said it right. I mean, I wrote an article a couple of weeks ago on the, the potential for rootworm damage in late planted corn. And so, and not only that, but also, you know, we hear these things about eggs being clotted if the, the soil is too wet and stuff like that. And so, so uh, the thing that, you know, uh, from years of data on rootworm, usually those uh, late planted, you know, those years that come with late planting do not get affected by corn rootworm feeding as much as the regular planting time. And we normally uh, do a really nice rootworm sampling where we wash the roots and we do ratings and we look for larvae and everything. The corn has been planted so late, and even though the, the, the plots were infested with neonates, it's not going to be a very good year to do that exercise. The one thing to keep in mind, though, is that with corn rootworms, even though late planted corn doesn't seem to be as heavily damaged as, as regular planted corn by the larval stage, we still have a pretty good risk of damage at the silk stage by the adults because, you know, the, those adults are going to be attracted to these fresh pollen and fresh silks, and that's where they're going to start doing their feeding. So there's a, a higher risk of that adult damage by corn rootworm, not so much by the larva. One thing that has been very common on this year on young plants is a disease called uh, holcus spot, which is a bacterial disease, so fungicide will, will not do anything. And so holcus spots are these kind of like oval to uh, irregular spots that are kind of like white or pale yellow in color. Some of them have a margin, some of them don't have a margin, and the damage can, the symptoms can look a lot like ramoxin injury. So that is another common disease of these wet weather. Historically, holcus spot hasn't seemed to be a damaging, yield damaging type of disease, so really nothing to worry too much about. They're not going to spread to healthy plants or anything like that. They do not produce spores, so it's just more of, of a cosmetic type of damage that they do. When in a wet year, there are probably going to be a lot of questions of just what is this and is it a yield robber? Yeah, correct. And, and like I said, Holoco spot, it's never been reported to cause uh, yield losses or anything. I think most of the hybrids have a, a pretty good level of uh, tolerance or resistance to, to Holoco spot. So really not much to worry about. If the conditions get kind of dry, the disease kind of stops or slows down. It's usually that rain splashing onto the leaves that kind of splashes that bacteria in there and creates those chlorotic circles or chlorotic spots on the leaves. All right. Now, Michael, for those that unfortunately have not been able to get a crop in, thinking about prevent plant, what kind of options do they have? Well, I mean, the options are spelled out quite well by the Midwest Cover Crops Council's website. They have a nice tool on their website that allows you to go in and, and actually put in the planting date, and you can choose from different reasons why you're planting that cover crop. So you can set goals. So in other words, if you're trying to scavenge nitrogen that you've already applied there for a corn crop, you may want to plant something that has a little deeper root to gather that nitrogen back in. The odd thing is that typically a lot of the cover crops that we plant in the fall of the year are more cool season crops. And so we're, we're in a bit of an unusual situation here, and that is why I am deferring to Edward's website. It really walks you through the issues uh, very nicely and give you a, a choice of, of several different things that you can plant, either uh, as standalone crops in that field or blends of several different crops. One thing, though, given how productive soil can be, you know, even by just a cover crop, it's surely in the crop's best interest or in the field's best interest to uh, put that soil to work. It is. You know, you know, you keep the biology alive in that field, and then and that biology, you know, is going to be similar to what happens in a corn crop, uh, and likewise broadleaf 
soybeans being a broadleaf, if you put another legume out there, it's going to be a similar biology that, that follows that legume. So, I mean, you can kind of, you know, obviously when you're looking at cover crops, you want to, you know, keep in mind what you're going to have there next year. So, you know, most likely in a lot of these fields where corn was planted to begin with, nitrogen went on, corn will be uh, what will be planted in those fields next year, especially if, if they've trapped that nitrogen in a cover crop. You do also need to keep in mind as you look at those, the one thing that the website that I mentioned will not give you a good idea about is termination of that crop. Is it going to need to be terminated in the fall of the year? Is that, or is it going to be simply that the, the frosts come as they usually do and that's enough to kill that crop off? So are you going to have to apply a herbicide or is it going to be one of those that killed by, you know, natural changing of the seasons? So these are things to keep in mind also, you know, as you look at those crop or crop choices, all these things are things that need to be taken into consideration is, is, is termination what's going to be needed to be done for tillage and what equipment you have and how well you'll be able to accomplish that task. And then, of course, uh, am I going to have to apply a herbicide at the end of the year to, you know, really burn that crop down and, and kill it off? All right. Very good stuff. Thanks so much for taking time. And uh, best uh, hope you have a very successful week in Monmouth. Uh, Victoria and Michael, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lost. Thanks, Lost. Victoria Klazewski, Grow Market Agronomy's Insect and Plant Disease Technical Manager. Michael Gill, also with the Cooperative Crop Nutrient Technical Manager. We'll have more to come on a Tuesday RFD today. and farmweeknow.com journalist Dina Stroish connects rural routes for you. From the farm bill to crop insurance to GMO labeling, her expertise is apparent in the story she reports. Here's a bit about her rural roots. I get to meet interesting people and share their stories, and I get paid to do it. I cover ag policy and really enjoy keeping the farming community updated on these important issues. Be it routes or roots, RFD Radio, farmweeknow.com and farmweek keep you connected. Hey farmers, join your partners in progress. Come see and hear how leaders in wastewater treatment, agriculture, and scientific research work individually and together to improve water quality. Fulton County Farm Bureau in West Central Illinois is holding a free Nutrient Field Day, Tuesday, July 16th, beginning at 11 a.m. in Cuba, Illinois. The day includes lunch, discussions, and a tour. Learn about new best management practices to use on your farm. Contact the Fulton County Farm Bureau to reserve your spot today. Time now to check your numbers here on a Tuesday. We are mixed as we report this hour. July nearby on the corn up one and a quarter, 456. September down a half, 461. December corn down three quarters this hour, 467 and three quarters. March down a half at 472 and a half. July soybeans up a nickel, 917 and three quarters. August up in nickel at 924 and a quarter. November up four and three quarters at 944 and a quarter. To the wheat, July wheat, Chicago down four, 535 and a half. September down four and a half. And December down four and a quarter. We're at 549 and three quarters. Bean meal for July down eight cents at 32350. Those are your numbers on the RFD Radio Network. Welcome back to RFD today. A few weeks back, uh, informational hearing in Marshall County on a proposed New South facility, Buffalo Run. We caught up with Dr. Nicholas Ripple to talk more about the benefits of livestock. Your Dr. Nicholas Ripple is with us. Nicholas, you have had uh, lots of opportunities to tell, as you pointed out, the, the pig farmer's story as a, a working veterinarian uh, coming back to Illinois doing business here. How do things look in Marshall County as you look to bring in a- another sow farm? Well, you know, uh, you know, Rita, two years ago, I had the opportunity to uh, reinvest in my home county of Marshall County with uh, Santa Creek Lane. Um, you know, we started off with, uh, with a fantastic open house. We had over 500 people attend. We ran out of uh, pork chops within the first hour of the open house. 
and since then we've uh, enjoyed uh, tremendous uh, uh, support from the community. I want to uh, repeat that success of Buffalo Run, which is on the opposite side of Marshall County, 24 miles away in the northwest corner, and we just want to report, repeat that success and reinvest in my uh, native county. I love that you use that word, reinvest, because it is an investment in, in rural Illinois. Yes, and, and it's an investment. Uh, we will provide uh, 25 new jobs uh, with over a million dollars in annual payroll. We will uh, use over 300,000 bushel of locally grown corn, uh, another 1,700 ton of uh, soybean mill uh, to feed the pigs at Buffalo Run. It's interesting as you tell uh, the story to the consumers, to those who live in town, but, you know, it seems like these days it doesn't hurt to, to you know, share that information with everybody, including the neighbors in that area. That's correct. And one of my points in the uh, informational meeting uh, last night was, you know, what, what has changed, you know, 60 years ago, if I wanted to start raising pigs in Marshall County, we did not uh, have a meeting to talk about it. Uh, my, my analysis of the reason why we have these uh, informational meetings is because uh, most people are far removed from either farming or, in this case, specifically uh, pig farming. Uh, and so I go out there and try to tell the story of the pig farmer or, in my case, the, the pig vet and show them how, you know, we raise pigs today uh, with modern science and, tech and uh, technology. And then you mentioned repeating the success that you've had at Sandy Creek. You know, it says a lot when you start with healthy sows, that says a lot for the whole chain. Yes, and, and uh, you know, that, that's one of the reasons why, we you know, we've uh, continued to try to repeat the success of Sandy Creek Lane in Marshall County is because, um, you know, there's not a lot of pigs in Marshall County um, as in other areas of the countryside. Uh, so we're able to start off, you know, Buffalo Run is going to be a, a what we call a south farm. So uh, we will produce uh, a three-week-old 15-pound pig uh, that will leave the farm and go to the owners, of, uh, the specific owners of that sow farm, go back to their own size to raise out the market size. So, we, you know, the health uh, pyramid starts at the sow farm. We start off with a healthy pig. Uh, at weaning time, that pig will continue to be healthy throughout the growth finish period. Now we get into to numbers uh, because we go back to, you know, who does this um, help? Uh, those sows eat a lot of corn and soybeans. And this day and age, especially 2019, uh, we, we need to be very uh, cognizant of the market uh, that those sows represent. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, they, the, the, the corn, corn and soybean growers in, in, in Illinois you know, and, and across the country do an excellent job uh, of, of being efficient in their own operations and producing a tremendous amount of, of corn and soybeans. You know, the majority, you know, over 50 percent of that uh, of, of corn uh, still goes to feed the livestock. Uh, of that, uh, uh, of course, pig. Uh, and again, you know, as far as the buffalo run itself, we use uh, 300,000 bushel of corn, 1,700 ton of soybean mill, and that's not even counting, uh, you know, the, the grow finished pigs that would uh, land uh, throughout uh, the state of Illinois, the, the number of bushel of elk. You know, one of our partners, uh, Nick Anderson with the Illinois Livestock Development Group, uh, he, you know, he said it in conversations uh, building up to that informational meeting, but, you know, Illinois in all facets needs to roll out the red carpet when it comes to new business and that uh, is for agriculture as well in this again in the state's history we need new business that's correct you know uh, again we're going to within a four-year period between sand creek lane and buffalo run we'll, we'll have provided uh, 50 new jobs and over two million dollars in annual payroll to marshall county you know it's just another way to reinvest into the community we need livestock or pigs in this case where the feed is uh there's a bund amount of corn to make uh feed for pigs in illinois as we look at uh, sandy creek and now the the buffalo run uh unit what would be your the best case scenario on on time on the time frame to bring this new sow farm online uh you know it's it, uh, a, a farm like this this, you know, takes time and the planning, obviously we're in the planning stages now with uh, going through the Illinois Department of Ag and the permitting process. There's lots of moving parts. Uh, similar to uh, Sandy Creek Lane, Buffalo Run, as I sit here today, there'll be, you know, a good probably two years before we have the first pig come onto the farm. Uh, projects of this uh, of this uh, stature just take some time to put together. Can you briefly just kind of talk about your partners and the, the farmer and the farms that you're partnered with and, and what you look for in partners? 
so I, I'm a veterinarian with DMC Management, uh, and, and, and DMC Management is a veterinarian-owned pig farm management business. We work with uh, independent pig farmers, so we, we our veterinary service team helps these independent farmers pull their resources together to own a sow farm, a breed to wean farm, uh, rather than each of the independent farmers owning their own sow farm. And then we provide, as DMC Management, we provide the employees or the, the pig caretakers uh, and we manage these caretakers. We manage the uh, health production of the farm for the, for the owners of the farm, the independent pig farmers. Uh, all of our uh, uh, caretakers are Port Quality Assurance certified, and on these sow farms, they, they breed uh, uh, adult female pigs, so sows. Uh, they care for them during their pregnancy and then assist these sows to deliver their pigs uh, and they care for those pigs during the lactation period. Then at uh, approximately three weeks of age, uh, and 15 pounds, we wean these pigs from the sows or we remove them from the sows and then we send them back to the owners of the farm, uh, their own independent uh, uh, wean finish barns across the, the state of Illinois. Mm. And we asked you earlier, you know, we talked about healthy sows making healthy pigs, a healthy industry with an issue like African swine fever and, you know, biosecurity, healthfulness, of the animal uh, uh, welfare ca- and uh, care uh, really comes into play in 2019 and for the future. Back to your case, you know, uh, starting with a healthy animal and uh, because of how you're based, uh, that makes uh, makes you feel good. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I spoke a lot about biosecurity at the informational meeting last night. Uh, you know that anymore. That's that's how we design pig farms is with with this with the idea of you know how do we keep you know the the bacteria and viruses that can cause uh, sickness and suffering in our pigs outside our walls of our farm. Um, you know, all the protocols we do to to, cut, to bring ourselves into the farm, to bring uh, supplies in the farm, or bring in replacement animals in the farm. You know, that you know, uh, an entire sow farm is designed around those concepts. Anything else I missed, uh, Nicholas, as far as um, the the site, the farm, uh, or your message to Illinois? You know, I'm I'm just excited again to uh, repeat the success we've had with Santa Creek Lane. You know, we're going to use, we're, we're going to employ, uh, 25, uh, local residents of Marshall County. Uh, we're going to use, uh, local corn and soybeans. Uh, we're going to pay property taxes. Uh, we're going to support, uh, the Marshall County school districts through those, uh, through those, uh, property taxes as well as the roads and bridges and, and other features throughout the county. Uh, I'm just glad to be able to have an opportunity to reinvest in my, uh, native county of Marshall County. Nicholas Ripple, Dr. Nicholas Ripple, and we'll be back with more news. This is RFD Today. Here's your livestock summary on the RFD Radio Network. I'm Rita Frazier. Meat producers' pain worsened yesterday as Their shares hurt by fears about how persistent flooding in the U.S. is affecting crops they rely on for feed. Millions of farm acres in the U.S. are set to go unplanted with corn and soybeans, the Wall Street Journal has reported. The shortages threaten to increase costs for meat producers such as Tyson Foods, Sanderson Farms, and Pilgrim's Pride Corporation. In the cash market in Illinois today, Illinois direct hogs 47 to 51 dollars for the top. As we look at the futures trading on a Tuesday, lean hogs for July were up seven at 83.12, August up 37.82.62. Feeder cattle August up 117, 138. September up 140, 138.57. How do people benefit from raising livestock here in Illinois? Rich Gebert, Illinois farmer, president of the Illinois Farm Bureau. Well, growing up on a livestock farm was always interesting, and I enjoy it more today than I did back then. But it did give me the opportunity to have a good work ethic, learn to get up in the morning. And you know, that was difficult during my senior days at high school and college days. I had a tendency not to go to bed at a respectable hour. But uh, no, it was always enjoyable on the farm and getting up before daybreak and milking the cows and getting the chores done and then go about the rest of the day's business. Illinois Farm Bureau, along with beef, corn, milk, pork, and soybean associations, 
make up the Livestock Development Group, supporting the Illinois livestock sector. For more information, check out IllinoisLivestock.org. We're back on RFD today, talking weather with Eric Schmidt at EJS Weather in Southern Illinois. Hey, Eric. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I was joking with you. I was like, hey, you got a dry forecast for us? Uh, I can't promise that this week or maybe next week. I guess let's kind of recap here. No one really in the state needs water at all, any additional rain, but how much have we picked up here in the last couple of days? Well, I mean, I know down in our part of the state, uh, we, it seems like we've gotten rain a little bit every every day or so. I know we got about three quarters of an inch la- uh, yesterday, and about another half inch to a three quarter inch the day before. So certainly, a lot of places have picked up uh, at least a couple inches here uh, throughout the state uh, over the last few days. And of course, that's just been part of a longer uh, wet pattern that we've seen. Now, when we look at the history books, are we looking at um, historic levels already for the state? Well, certainly that's a possibility. I know, again, for down here, that we've seen above normal precip uh, every month of this year so far, and it looks like June is going to add on to that total. So certainly uh, um, the region would be wetter than average. Um, have to look a little closer to see if we're – near uh, on pace for any uh, historic uh, yearly average rainfall totals. But uh, uh, certainly uh, it's definitely been a wet one. So what are you looking for? Let's do short term here in Illinois, you know, the next week. It looks like more showers and storms uh, for Wednesday, especially across uh, central and southern Illinois, as we've got uh, kind of our same pattern. We've got a stalled front in the area and an area of low pressure going to be moving along that front. So it looks like a lot of the state is going to see more rainfall tomorrow. Uh, get a brief uh, dry day on Thursday for most of the state. Uh, possibly a few more storms as we look into Friday as we get a warm front that will be kind of coming across the state. Uh, Saturday will uh, looks, again, mainly dry, and uh, with a brief warm-up we, uh, with temperatures getting into the Upper 80s, some spots may see 90 degrees on Saturday, uh, although with all the rainfall, that may keep the highs down a little bit. Unfortunately, we see uh, another front come in on Sunday with more storms. So, And then even into next week, the pattern looks to be one of uh, kind of a maybe slightly warmer than average temperatures, but still spotty storms throughout next week. Mm. So, Eric, uh, our grain analyst, a uh, market analyst, Joe Camp, uh, is now sitting in with us. And I know on, on his daily duties as he's watching the markets, he's really interested in this forecast, especially for the Midwest. Right, Joe? Absolutely. We're concerned about the forecast, how much will be uh, yet planted, and the concern that's out there. And that's what I'd be most interested in hearing from Eric is whether or not there's a lot of concern about the new crop and is that causing reluctance in your marketing decisions for this next crop? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, yeah, certainly, I mean, the crops that are just being planted, of course, uh, all this wet weather uh, is raising a lot of concern, I know, with farmers that I've talked to in in this area. And uh, uh, so certainly, uh, like I said, the forecast looks to remain wet for the next week or two. And uh, so certainly not good for new crops that are being planted. Yeah, and where you are in that part of the state, you know, and and no one, even in this situation, I know that there's farmers in your neck of the woods, Eric, that say, you know, I don't want to tell Mother Nature to shut the faucet off because, in, in, you know, we, we just don't want to do that in southern Illinois. It doesn't take long for things to turn around. No, I mean, certainly that would be the, one of the worst-case scenarios is, the you know, the crops that do make it, and then if the faucet does shut off, as we get further into July and especially into August, uh, certainly that would produce a uh, not a good situation for them. And, uh, you know, looking a little longer term uh, at the long-range models right now, there is some indication, at least in them right now, of uh, possibly hotter and somewhat drier patterns setting up toward early July. Now, whether or not that will uh, persist and stick around and be a more longer-term pattern is, uh, not really expected, but uh, there is some uh, 
showing of possibly a pattern change toward early July, and we'll have to watch that. Yeah, you can just turn that one around there, Eric. Take that one back and send it back where it came from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anything else here in the, in the nearby as we, you know, look to the last uh, week or so of June, and then we turn the calendar to the 4th of July? Yeah, like I mentioned, uh, as we get toward uh, end of June, early July, toward the July 4th holiday, uh, some of the longer-range models right now are showing more of an upper-level ridge uh, coming from the central plains toward this, uh, toward the Midwest, uh, especially like central and southern Illinois would be affected by that ridge more, possibly more of a drier pattern. Uh, your jet stream also is advertised to go further north, kind of across the northern plains, uh, upper Midwest, northern Great Lakes. That would be more of your active storm track pattern would be up there. So that's kind of a typical uh, classic summer pattern if that shapes up. Uh, again, how long that will persist and whether or not it will become firmly established is still up in the air. But certainly if that would take place, uh, parts of the region would become hotter and drier uh, during that time. Mm. About a minute left here, guys. Either either of you have any other comments as we head into the, the tail end of this program? Eric, you got a good handle on the weather there. If it does get warmer and drier, do you have some op- optimism about how this, shape, uh, this crop could shape up eventually? Well, I mean, certainly uh, the, the farmers wouldn't mind having the uh, drier period, especially with, the, like I said, the next week or two still looks pretty active. So, but uh, they don't want the, uh, they don't want, they certainly wouldn't want that pattern to persist through much of July and into August, uh, you know, as they're still going to want the uh, scattered showers, the sporadic showers at times. So hard to say with the El Nino that is still in place. I don't wouldn't uh, forecast that uh, drier pattern to set up the whole rest of the summer uh, hey, based on climate averages.